Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is a cruise from Mars Tonic. Uh, I work with uh, Nintendo, actually um, a recent startup. Uh, we started quite a few years ago. Um, we got of people into many news and areas. Um, today, I'm just speaking about how to do security, and we got a chance to actually work on one of the interesting projects. Um, so, the question is, is it a gimmick, or is it a game changer? On the agenda, um, I will be talking about the hardware-based security project uh, called Digital Security by Design. Um, I know that there's quite a few other um, hardware-based security projects, but in particular, this is the one that I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to mention the organizations and the enterprises that are involved within this project. There's quite a few big names out there, so I thought it was uh, worth mentioning. I'm going to talk about the actual problems that hardware-based security tends to tackle. Um, I'm also going to talk about the new technology that actually has been in, uh, introduced and developed throughout this project. Um, how does hardware-based security actually tackle today's security vulnerabilities and issues? And in addition, our uh, Pateri's involvement, which is a company that I work for, on the our proof of concept project. Um, and finally, I will also uh, talk about the feasibility of hardware-based uh, security. Is it really necessary? Uh, what are the alternatives? Um, and is it actually worthwhile looking into? So, who is involved um, and why did it really start? Um, digital Security by Design, which I will refer to as uh, DSPD, a lot quicker and a lot easier. Um, what it aims to do is fundamentally change the computing infrastructure by creating new, more secure hardware as well as software. Um, DSDB is a joint research uh, project by University of Cambridge and uh, SRI International. And for anyone who doesn't know about SMA International, it's an American research institute. They're the trustees of Stanford University and have done numerous projects with the United States Department of Defense, the Department of Education, and the, the Healthcare Institute as well. So this is this project is also directly sponsored by the UK government, which part of the funding there. Um, and ultimately it tries to bring together the world leading uh, research base with Britain's best businesses just for a safer future. And in terms of funding, it brought together uh, about 70 million pounds worth of government funding, uh, which was then matched by 117 million pounds worth of industry investment. And as you can see, there's quite a few big names there on Microsoft, the Department of Science, HP, the Logan Institute, which Queens, of course, picked it in. So, what are the actual problems that the SPD has to tackle? First thing first, there are billions of lines of existing C and C++ code. Uh, they all contain errors and unknown vulnerabilities. Now, because ultimately people who write the software are human beings, and um, human beings are inherently prone to make mistakes, these errors will continue to happen. And an error in particular I'm talking about is the memory signal. Um, in addition, people are constantly being pushed for deadlines meaning that it is often preferred to reuse existing code and through the reuse of existing code uh, further vulnerabilities could be introduced. Now, a lot of time um, we don't see the vulnerabilities immediately and it takes quite a bit of time for the exploits to come through and to be taken advantage of and um, particularly where the software that's been uh, produced back in the 1980s and 1990s um, and then we only find vulnerabilities recently. Um, which was particularly seen in the 2017 NHS uh, ransomware attack. And I'm sure not everybody already heard of it, uh, but I thought it was a uh, noteworthy matchup. Um, so what happened was a bunch of uh, devices under the NHS uh, framework was uh, attacked, and hundreds of devices were taken down, uh, meaning that a lot of data was lost and productivity. Um, as I remember, it was about 19,000 appointments that were cancelled overall. Um, about 72 million pounds worth um, of taxpayers' money was used to actually bring these systems back up and uh, get the data back. Um, but the most um, interesting thing that I found was that the vulnerability um, was caused and was inherently rooted in Windows SMB software. Now, interestingly, it was developed back in 1984. 
which is the first place. And it was so interesting to see because a building back in 1984 caused such a massive, such massive amounts of damage but, uh, for the only 20 something. Um, in addition to that, uh, what was really interesting to see was that a month prior to the attack, uh, Microsoft actually were made aware of this vulnerability and they actually released as an emergency security patch. Um, I'm not sure about the inner details of the NHS, but they actually failed to deploy uh, the patch. Either you know, uh, they were unable to due to resource constraints or else this, they just uh, were not made aware. Um, but it's just really interesting because even if you do find uh, a fix for the errors in, in the existing software, the difficulty is also actually deploying these patches and applying it out in the field. Um, so, attempting to maintain the existing and newly written code and um, patching from errors and um, keeping safe from vulnerabilities is extremely useless and intensive. Um, and ultimately, if we are going to always assume that there's going to be um, mistakes being made in the new existing code, in, uh, yeah, in the existing code or the new code, how can these uh, be found and prevented from being discarded? Um, if you can't fix the software, ultimately your next best bet is the hardware. And this is exactly what the SVD attempts uh, to eradicate entirely. Um, until now, their premise by digital security or design offers have been blocked by the need to develop the hardware on software simultaneously. And there's quite a few good reasons for that. Right? Developing brand new hardware um, is very resource intensive and expensive. Um, also trying to convince organizations, enterprises, and individuals to take their existing um, uh, hardware that they're already paying for, that they're already implemented, that they're already familiar with, um, to exchange it for a brand new hardware that they have to purchase um, and learn how to use is a rather difficult task. Um, so to move uh, both hardware and software at the same time uh, really requires a revolution. You know, to the way these processes currently work, rather than just an evolution of uh, the current technology, which we have seen uh, previously, because it's much harder to simply just make the current technology better with software. That's where a lot of the focus uh, is going. So, um, the other problems is the 70% of software vulnerabilities are generally acknowledged to be memory safety issues. Right? This, this statistic that has been referenced by DSPD themselves has been referenced by US National Security. It is also uh, very interesting for me uh, to hear that the uh, two talks that occurred this morning, one by um, the CTO of the British National Security Center, and as well as the Microsoft researcher, they both actually mentioned these um, statistics. Um, so languages like C and C++ provide a high degree flexibility and efficiency in memory management, but with the honest on the programmer to do the same thing. It's how letting the programmer have all control whenever it comes to memory management, and inherently there's always going to be mistakes being made, which is why there's so many vulnerabilities and an increase in vulnerabilities and cybersecurity today. So any bugs can lead to issues such as buffer overflow, um, or unintentionally accessing objects of the wrong type, which can be turned to exploit by an attacker. So, the revolution in the hardware-based security technology, I am going to mention all the new technology that's been introduced through this project, which aims to completely eradicate these memory and safety issues. First one, um, it is Cherry. Um, it's the new instruction set architecture. And it is based on the existing uh, risk and um, <laughs> uh, but it's currently um, based on the risk and existing instruction set um, and it just been enhanced. And the way I like to call it is an instru a new instruction set architecture that's just been pumped with steroids. Um, so risk is a well known um, Concept uh, now has been widely implemented in the field, AMD consumer grade um, and industry grade uh, microprocessors have been using it for many years. In addition, ARM has also developed extensions based on this um, architecture for their own new mobile microprocessors such as the Snapdragon. 
So what Cherry aims to do is to provide a memory protection model via capabilities. Okay, capabilities is of extreme importance, but I will cover them in the next slide um, because it just deserves a lot more detail. In addition to the new instruction set, ARM came on board um, simply because ARM recognized the potential in this new uh, capability architecture and specifically in deterring certain key security breaches that it can uh, prevent. They decided to take part in this project um, by producing a Morello evaluation work uh, which implemented this new architecture. And in addition to the new hardware, we um, this project also um, implemented this new Cherry BSD operating system and um, it's solely based on the existing free BSD uh, which is Unix like operating system and the only changes that has been made to that is to actually implement these new um, memory protection um, features called capabilities. And because this new eco uh, system has been developed from the hardware up, um, applications can now then be um, compiled specifically for this new architecture and utilize these new uh, features. So, um, introducing the actual Cherry concept, right? Like, how, what is the difference between the traditional approach and why does it actually matter? So, mainstream computer systems are insecure in large part because of a combination of the conventional hardware architecture in addition to the C and C++ languages, which provide only coarse grain memory protection. Now, whenever you give whenever you give full control to the developer, and when it comes to accessing allocating and deallocating memory, errors will always occur. Um, and because of these coding errors, exploitable security vulnerabilities are introduced. So Cherry architecture revises this hardware software architectural interface with hardware support for unfortunable capabilities, which are used for fine-grained memory protection and compartmentalization. Um, now one of the interesting quotes um, which was provided by Paul Waller, was that this BD challenge aims to ease the burden on developers of ensuring that the products are hard to exploit. And this is exactly what the project aims to do, is to completely eradicate these um, memory safety issues that C++ and C++ introduces. So I mentioned these cherry capabilities quite a few times now. So what actually are they? So on the left here, we have this classic approach. Pretty simple. We got a pointer with an address and reference, which points directly to an addressable memory. While on the right, we have this new DSBD approach. Now, to the addition of the address reference, we have metadata. Now, through the use of this new metadata, it provides us much, much more control over to the, the traditional approach. The combination of the address reference and the metadata, we now call this capability. And due to this new capability, we are able to um, extract these new um, validations that we can enforce uh, when accessing um, memory. One of them being validity and integrity. So what we can do is we can ensure that the capability is valid and there were no problems. Permanence. So in a case where a process is trying to access memory that's, that doesn't actually even exist in addressable memory, we know that it really shouldn't exist. Um, another thing is bounds. We can significantly limit the area of memory that can be accessed. So due to these, uh, due to new metadata, instead of the process having access to the entire addressable memory, so in the case of an exploit, you're able to um, access anything they want. And um, with the DSBD approach, we're actually setting hard limits on what the process can actually access in terms of the rest of the memory. And um, in an exploit, we cannot go beyond these limits. Uh, we also have these new permissions, uh, constraining the set of operations that can be performed. Essentially, if a process requests write and read um, permissions, we can grant them. And um, whenever it comes to, let's say, they no longer need write permissions, no they need read permissions. What we can do is we can decrease this, these permissions, and those will be the permissions that they can only use. If they want to deallocate the memory, 
then there is no permissions um, at all. Um, in addition, we have monotonicity, which is bounds and permissions cannot be increased. So whenever it comes to the bounds, the process will receive a certain amount of addressable memory, and there will be a hard limit of that. Be, they will never be able to get more memory, and uh, therefore limiting uh, this addressable space that they can access. In addition, permissions can also no longer be increased. So in a case where a process wants to read and write to memory, um, and then they're no longer needed, let's say they, they, they allocate the memory entirely, and um, those permissions will be gone forever, and they will not be able to retrieve them again. And through the use of these new capabilities, what we can then achieve is compartmentalization, uh, which really just uh, provides us with fine-grained compartmentalization of memory, so that the misuse can be significantly reduced. So as we can see, see in the uh, last slide, during the classic approach, in, the, in, a, in an exploit, whenever there's a breach of memory, which could be anything such as uh, a buffer overflow, um, the attacker can actually exploit any piece of addressable memory. But whenever it comes to this new DSVD approach, because we have these capabilities and set limits, um, even in the case where the exploiter can breach the process, they will only be able to access a very small limited amount of data, meaning that the damage they can actually induce is significantly reduced. A uh, simple uh, exploit will not provide full access to the entire addressable memory. And more, of, um, more often than not, uh, whenever it comes to these uh, cases and exploits, whenever an attacker does gain uh, access to the limited area, oftentimes there will, no, uh, there will be no valuable uh, addressable memory on the contents of it will uh, not be of interest to the attacker. Therefore, it cannot achieve anything valuable. So I'm going to just talk about um, actually Patelli's involvement. Um, everything that I talked about previously was just solely based on theory. Um, so with Patelli, we had a chance to contribute to the DSPD project and work on an actual uh, proof of concept. Um, it's all well and good whenever you have theory, uh, but we also need to ensure that this can actually be implemented in real time, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Um, in autumn 2020, UK Research Innovation ran a competition to fund a range of projects that work to enrich and expand this baby software. Now you can imagine that we have this new hardware, we have this brand new instruction set that nobody has ever used, we have a specialized CPU, we have this new operating system, so we need to develop everything else to support it, um, which is what we call a software ecosystem. So, us, Padilla, we applied for this competition and we actually were one of the 10 UK white winners of the 2021 Digital Security by Design, um, which is a software ecosystem competition. And we were allowed to go ahead and implement the software and actually make a positive contribution to uh, DSPD. So the project that we specifically focused on was secure high performance packet processing, one of the fundamentals. So packet processing is a core network uh, networking concept widely used in firewalls, network monitoring, storage backup, packets are received from network and for the classification, filtering or other uh, processing. Now this packet processing um, is usually divided into two separate approaches. Distributor approach, which mainly focus on the security. Um, there is also the monolithic approach, which is quite the opposite. It focuses on performance. Now, the way the distributor approach achieves its security is by using the enter uh, process communication. Uh, what it essentially does is the processes, such as the plugin, and the rest of the processes within the network stack are completely isolated. So they have their own shared address spaces which they cannot um, access. Now, by using this um, enter process uh, communication mechanism and running these processes in separate um, address spaces, the problem is that this introduces a massive bottleneck in terms of performance because you need that overhead to share, such as the packet information. Whenever it comes to the monolithic approach, they have Significant improved in 
performance by using this new data plane value kit. And what it really does is gets rid of this overhead that this distributor approach um, introduces by running all the processes within, so the plugin, uh, third party plugin, for example, and the network stack processes under the exact same shared memory address. Um, PPDK, the data plane development kit, essentially is just a set of libraries um, that focuses on receiving and sending packets uh, within the minimal number of CPU cycles. Uh, because of their approach of running multiple processes under the exact same shared memory, this uh, introduces a lot of risk uh, vulnerabilities and security risks. So as I was uh, doing some research um, over this new um, approach, so we're performing the approach and recognizing that there are so many um, security risks that uh, have been introduced. Um, I wanted to know if there's any known uh, vulnerabilities that this approach has already introduced and they were well documented. Um, through my research, I found that there was actually 16 known vulnerabilities um, and seven of them in particular caught my eye. Now, the reason why is because they were actually caused by um, out of bounds memory read and writes. Um, buffer overflows, um, lack of points checking, and permission flaws. And the reason why it was so interesting to me because this is exactly what the DSPD project tries to eradicate entirely. So, no one um, this approach um, and the security list that uh, it introduces, we had an idea of why not combining both approaches, so the monolithic approach and the DSPD approach. The DSPD approach and um, introducing security through the capabilities on um, the monolithic approach, which is the more performed approach. So we had this idea and wanted to test it because what if we can actually achieve the best of both worlds? We can achieve performance and security at the same time. So once we came with the approach, we put it to work. And um, Pateria worked with DSPD to show the cherry capabilities could be used for performance secure packet processing. And the way that we did that was by receiving the Morello board that was developed by ARM, which enabled the cherry capabilities. And uh, we actually received it um, in person and actually run it in real time. We also used Cherry BSD for open system that has been developed, developed um, and we installed it. We then ported the data pane development kit, which is seen in the model of the approach to achieve performance. It was ported over to the Morello board. Um, on this new architecture simply for packet processing performance improvement. Now, there was also um, a new application that was developed in house using C and it was called Limelight. Um, and we aimed to prove that the cherry capabilities could in fact secure the network packets. And the way that we did that was actually try to modify the packets directly. And we ensure to ensure that we cannot read outside of capability bonds, we cannot write to read only capability, and buffer cannot be illegally reused. So this application was called as a third-party plugin. What we attempted to do was we uh, consume the packets as a read-only permission, and we tried to modify these uh, packets directly. Once we actually had this implementation running and implemented, uh, we decided to compare it against a distributed approach which uses the enter process communication with the performance bottleneck. The new DSPD approach ran the application and the plugins under the same process, meaning that it was run under the same shared address space, just like the monolithic approach. But because of these new capabilities, we could enforce uh, safety, specifically memory safety, through hardware means. The particular performance matrix that we looked into was packet processing latency and CPU utilization. And we measured those against various uh, packet points and various packet sizes. Specifically, packet sizes, 512 bytes, right up to 8,000 uh, bytes. And then in terms of the packet count, we had numerous test cases, ranging from 20,000 packet counts right up to 200,000. All right. Once we actually measured those, uh, measured the two approaches, and got a response matrix and actually plotted it in the graph, we were very fast and surprised. Uh, as we can see here to the left, the latency was packet size, 
uh, of the PSVD approach, Berlin with its staging system. Uh, comparing this to the traditional approach, that is widely um, implemented throughout the entire world, and the enter process um, approach, uh, like the latency of it, increased significantly, which is even on much to PSVD. And uh, whenever it came to CPU utilization, we can see that the SPD approach also replaced a lot less CPU um, resources. And I think it's funny to see that the worst case of the SPD was the actual best case of the traditional approach. Um, we also got uh, quite a bit of positive feedback from uh, John Gutiker. Um, and he's just happy to see that we can actually use this new DSBD um, approach. Um, Combine it with format approaches and achieve both security and performance at the same time. In conclusion, uh, the theorized cherry capabilities were implemented and shown to be working successfully in real time. And it combined the new hardware, the new instruction set, the new operating system, and new applications together to work seamlessly. The DSBD approach showed that using memory safe cherry capabilities required significantly less uh, resources, provided lower latency, and it was a lot more stable, while at the same time being completely memory safe. Uh, proving the SPD as a superior, scalable, and performant method packet processing approach, which I believe is step one in providing, and proving that this new approach can be broadly applied, applied and eradicate the memory exploits introduced by software existing and linked specifically for C and C. Now, do we really need this new hardware. Right? Hardware is hard to implement. It's so expensive. So let's look at the alternative options, specifically software, cheaper alternative options. Rust being one of them. I know that previous uh, talkers also mentioned Rust and other things too, and uh, memory safety. Um, and I do agree, it is a really good alternative. It is an alternative to C and C++, but with new concepts that improve memory safety. Which is exactly what hardware based security has to do. And they achieved this new memory safety uh, through the use of ownership and borrowing. And essentially, ownership, each piece of memory is an owner, and there can only be one owner at a time, as well as borrowing. Uh, multiple pieces of code can have access to a piece of memory, but only one right here. In addition, there's a few um, other uh, features which are notably uh, mentioned resizable data structures. As well as integer types, including overflow data tracking. Through these new concepts and features, common memory related bugs like null pointers, uh, use after three errors, and buffer overflows are entirely good. But there is one issue. What about the existence in C++ code? Right, there's billions and billions of lines of C++ code in existence. So, how do we go about fixing that? One answer is, let's rewrite about uh, the existence of the C++ code in Rust. But whenever we have such a copious amount of code, it's not really feasible. And it will require a significant amount of resources. So some of the hurdles that can be faced by hardware and uh, face security in terms of uh, implementation, which is migration to cloud computing. Uh, migration to cloud computing is ever going. Um, and without the on-premise data centers, the companies no longer need uh, to consider such as space uh, considerations, power requirements, uh, purchase of expensive equipment, and the maintenance of this equipment. Um, now, of course, as a consumer, all you care about is here's my application, here are the requirements for that application, you just go run it and add on the rest. And ultimately, as a consumer of cloud computing, you really should care about the hardware that your application is on. But I understand, I understand the argument. I'm sure. And as a consumer, you don't really need to worry about that because it's up to the provider. But at the end of the day, the provider should be the one who cares because it is their responsibility to release and secure hardware and make sure that it's being kept up to date. Um, and even AWS themselves uh, said that they have over 300 available cybersecurity tools that their consumers can use. So ultimately, the cloud providers actually do care. Um, the biggest hurdle of them all is the requirement of 
new hardware and software. And we have a new board with a specialized CPU. We have a new instruction set architecture, a new office system, and all the existing applications to make it compatible to run this new um, architecture set must be even have. So that is a significant amount of effort that's been put in. Um, and one of the biggest hurdles is actually convincing uh, companies to give up their existing um, hardware that they paid for, that they tested, that's working, and to replace it with this new hardware. Um, and yeah, it's really hard to argue against that, but I do have one solution that you potentially use. Uh, let me introduce tested by PSPD console. Even though you may not have the hardware, and the hardware will not be available, and you may not have to purchase it, what you can do is you can build your application for Cherry uh, architecture, meaning that even if your application is going to be for a different architecture entirely, what you can still do is build and compile your application specifically for the Cherry architecture. Now, you're not going to get the real-time uh, memory safe capabilities, but you will uh, be met with a lot of compilers in the case where there are um, memory safety vulnerabilities. By using, um, by compiling, you can detect these vulnerabilities and eliminate them early, which you would not get from typical um, compiler uh, for different architecture. Um, and you can utilize these cherry compiler checks without having any of the hardware or the software. And um, all you need is the compiler that's capable of doing it. And um, ultimately, I think the best solution for it, and um, whenever it comes to testing pipelines, is you have a pipeline that uh, compiles your application and tests and run tests on it, and um, specifically for your targeted uh, architecture. On the other hand, you have this cherry architecture, and you simply just check for comp uh, compilation errors. Um, and having this uh, implemented uh, within your um, testing pipelines, you can have a pretty confidence level when delivering incremental changes, such as every single time you push a pull test up, uh, you can run these pipelines and uh, get the, the benefit of the cherry architecture. So, hardware based security is it a gimmick or a game changer? I will let all of you decide for yourselves. Um, I was Martin Stanley. Hey, welcome, Peter. Thank you for your invited attention. Okay. okay, we have time for a few questions, and uh, maybe you're all getting hungry and waiting for lunch uh, downstairs, but certainly, floor is yours, folks. Do you want to ask a few questions right now? So, the data development kit, um, as you mentioned, they support x86 architecture, they support uh, ARM architecture as well. Now, because, so ARM architecture is uh, based on the RISC, the existing RISC architecture, um, and Cherry extends the RISC architecture. So, all we had to um, do was actually consider the new extensions that were added to the original RISC architecture. So, it was just extra. Uh, CPU instructions that we have to be very well. It seems that this is fairly good at protecting processes from other processes without a lot of extra coding effort. But does it protect a process from, say, code injection into that process? By design, no. But what it aims to do is limit the damage that with a vulnerability, let's say a vulnerability, uh, that can be made. Right? Um, because you have these hard limits on uh, the address space, you will be severely limited on damage that you can do. Yes. But it's extremely limited. Yeah, so if you have two processes, right, 
uh, one process gets an allocated um, area of code, I mean, sorry, of memory, and another process uh, gets allocated memory as well, and they're sharing the exact same memory, right? They will never overlap. The bonds will never allow for one process to cross into the realm of another. Well, the main game that you get is that any errors that are on uh, within the code, specifically memory safety errors, they simply cannot be exploited. So we're recompiling the existing code onto the new. You will get all the benefits. Yeah, you will get benefits immediately because these new capabilities, right, are set by hardware, right? They're enforced by hardware, and they cannot be overridden through software. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think this is something that could actually have, have a, a deep dive technical session on its own. I think there's a lot more discussion in this one, but um, yeah. feel free to come up and we can have a yeah. discussion. All right. Any further questions then, folks? Yep. Okay. One last one. No. Um, so it really is just an evaluation work. Um, the specifically the Morello board that um, implements this new uh, Cherry architecture. Uh, what it really is, is just a proof of concept that we can actually achieve this. Um, so in the near future, yes, it may be possible. Um, if you were part of the, the very first talks, I was the CTO from the British National um, Cyber Security Center. He actually mentioned that this is about a 20 year project. So we're going to actually see if this is something that we really, really need and if it's really useful. And um, the results so far prove that this is absolutely necessary and this is incredible. And um, one of the other interesting uh, talkers was the Microsoft researcher who was dealing with memory safety issues every single day, right? And she actually cursed C as C++ because that is all she sees. And in one of the particular examples, whenever I had a chat to her after the talk, she said that even a couple of days ago, what she saw was that there was a vulnerability that was due to the memory safety issue that we, um, within Windows which was written in 19, 1989 or so. So she's so, so surprised that this vulnerability has existed this entire time, a vulnerability that is actually older than her. Uh, but yeah, I get to the point is, yeah, this is more of a proven concept at the moment, but there is definitely uh, potential to roll this out in the broader market. Okay. I think that's us. Uh, lunch is downstairs, folks, and uh, we'll be back later on. Thank you, thank you, wonderful applause. Thank you. Now.